And it really goes to prove that if you don't measure something, nothing will be done about it. And we have to make New Jersey's business climate more attractive for entrepreneurs. We are Wonder Women. Like, look at all these women and what they've done and what they've tried. And even if they didn't succeed, they gave it a shot. I don't think it's fair to put a four or five billion dollar price tag on middle class New Jerseyans. We've got a great lifestyle here and I don't want to see it ruined because politicians can't manage our finances properly. Welcome to As a Matter of Fact, I'm Lisa Allen and we are filming from the HGTV studio in Summit, New Jersey. Earlier this year, Monmouth University's Polling Institute released their annual report on the Quality of Life Index. The 2019 report showed that barely half of New Jersey residents give positive marks as a great place to live, which underscores an all-time low in sentiment dating back to the 1980s. Here to help us understand the financial factors that influence the perception of the public's quality of life is Regina Agia. Regina is the president of the Garden State Initiative, which is a public policy think tank focused on fiscal and economic policy in New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining me, Regina. Thanks for having me, Lisa. I am excited to have you because we've talked a lot about the economy in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'm a Colorado native, you're a New Jersey native. Mm -hmm. So as a kind of a newbie, so to speak, mm -hmm. I've been here about 11 years and I have fallen in love with New Jersey. I think it is one of the best places to live. You're kind of bracketed in between major cities. You have DC, New York, um, Boston. You can be at the beach in an hour. You can be in the mountains in an hour. And every person, anyone you talk to, always thinks their town is the best one to live in. You need to do a commercial for New I, Jersey. <laughs> right? I really, I love it. And my husband's from here. And I never yeah. thought I would stay and enjoy it as much as I have. Um, so as a New Jersey native, I can understand why you, you, know, you are here. And mm. you have done a lot of work both both in private, public, and volunteerism. And so I do want to talk about the quality of life, but I want to hear for you, from you, and for the viewers, tell me a little bit about your background and why you have been in New Jersey your entire life. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I was born, raised, and educated through college in New Jersey. And um, I lived outside the state for a few years, but have come back and raised my family here in the state. And as you just described, you know, the many attributes of the, uh, both the physical uh, geography as well as the situation uh, around other cities make it a, an ideal place to be able to expose children and um, have access to all sorts of different, um, you know, things that we enjoy. Mm -hmm. So it's a terrific state and um, I want to, you know, continue to be able to enjoy it with my family. And there are some concerns that I've got that I've been working on, as you mentioned. Uh, because I think that the, some of the uh, challenges that we have ahead will be opportunities uh, for New Jersey to either continue to prosper and other people will want to enjoy these attributes or I think we might have some risks. Right. Well, you have a lot of experience. You worked at AT&T as an SVP. You've worked for a governor's administration. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in the, pri in the public sector that led you into the public sphere? Sure. As you mentioned, uh, I worked at AT&T and um, I went through a pretty classic management program where I worked all over the company in business and consumer and the network as well as uh, marketing and sales. And um, most of the time um, out of New Jersey, but also in California and New York. And it was an, a great, um, you know, education from a uh, understanding how uh, you know, businesses run as well as how to appeal to consumers, you know, and businesses. And at the same time, I was raising a family and living uh, mostly here in New Jersey, as I said. And, um, you know, I was in a small town in Morris County. And as my children entered school, I realized, you know, I wasn't able during the day to be at um, different functions. So it became attractive to me to join the Board of Education, mm -hmm. uh, which is my first exposure in the, in the public arena. And um, so when my children were uh, very young, I joined the Board of Ed. And to tell you how uh, unfamiliar I was with politics, I, they were looking for someone to fill a term and they selected me. And then they handed me a petition. And I said, what do you mean I have to run? You know, I had no idea it was an elected position. I thought it was volunteer. Um, but it turned out I ran and was elected and reelected and enjoyed it very much. Um, but I always got put onto the budget committees, no matter where I've served, because of my business background. Mm -hmm. So it was a nice confluence of being able to take my uh, experience in business 
and be able to use it, I think, to the benefit of the public, because I could translate what feels like government speak mm -hmm. um, into pretty plain language and you know what was really going on in different budgets. So that's where I began. Mm, wow. And you were the deputy mayor at one point, right? Yes, after the Board of Ed, I was asked to run for the Township Committee, uh, which I did, and um, yes, and then I became deputy mayor. I ultimately um, was re-elected uh, to the Township Committee, but as I became more uh, senior in Trenton, I thought it was more appropriate that I resign my seat on the committee and not feel like uh, I was conflicted mm -hmm. uh, serving you know, the local town versus the administration when I joined Governor Christie's administration. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about working in the administration and what that meant for you and what you learned while you were there? Well, it was interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I learned actually locally was that practically everything is influenced by Trenton. Mm -hmm. And um, I consciously thought that if I was ever going to you know, work further in government, I wanted to be in Trenton mm -hmm. because uh, that was really where a lot of the money was controlled as well as the policies. And um, I thought it would be actually serve my town better by being more involved in Trenton. So um, coincident with AT&T um, was acquired by a Texas firm, and uh, I didn't want to leave New Jersey. Mm. And so <laughs> I consciously, at the end of 08, um, you know, exited uh, AT&T and then joined the campaign for Governor Christie because um, there was a lot of um, local interest in, you know, where we headed in the right direction. So that's how I became involved with the campaign because I was locally elected. I knew individuals who introduced me to the campaign mm -hmm. and I worked on the policy side uh, team that was supporting Governor, well, then candidate Christie in 09. Mm. And when I joined, um, afterwards I became the chief of staff to the treasurer. Once again, um, you know, when you're familiar with handling a lot of numbers, it's a skill that, um, it's not rare, but it's unusual uh, in the government. So I began in the treasurer's office and uh, I often, remark, uh, working for Treasurer Aristoff, Andrew Aristoff, um, was like getting a, a master's degree mm -hmm. um, because he was so familiar with tax and how to, the finances. And, um, you know, spending those two years in Treasury really helped me learn how state government really worked from mm. the inside. That's probably a whole nother conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and that ended up leading you to Garden State Initiative, which you were the president of. Um, what was the genesis of that? Sure. And actually, you know, just to uh, close that conversation, I was both the chief to the treasurer and the, and the governor. But all through the administration, we talked about that there was no external organization that really provided analysis and comment on different economic policies. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, being uh, originally from New York, would say, you know, there are five or six in New York that always give feedback on the budget and the policies, and there's just no one at an economic level doing it. So when I left at the end or the middle of 16, um, I thought that uh, that was an opportunity to really try to see was there an appetite for and, um, you know, was there really the void that we thought was there. And that became the genesis for trying to put together a public policy think tank hmm. uh, focused on fiscal matters here in the state. What did that look like when you put it together? Was it, was it difficult? I mean, you were kind of in that space, so you knew a lot of people. But was it still hard to bring people from both sides of the aisle to support you in your endeavor? Um, actually, I got wonderful advice um, from both sides, um, but particularly from my friends on the Democratic side in that uh, their advice was, number one, uh, it's really not bipartisan, it's nonpartisan. Right. Um, and number two, that if you can stick to economic and economic growth matters, that's appealing to everybody and that's important to everybody. And as long as we're not ideological, which I think we've been able to build that brand that we're not, and really focused on what's best for New Jersey that we could draw from both sides. And I think so far, so good. Mm -hmm. That's a great segue. So what research do you do at Garden State Initiative? Well, it's um, focused, as I say, on the economic matters, and our most recent work over the last nine months has been called Adding It All Up. And one of the questions um, you know, we wanted to answer was to take a step back, and you know, most of us see our government in slices. Like we go to you know, the governor's uh, speech on the budget, or we might go to a township committee meeting, or we see our property tax bill, and we see municipal and education. And we wanted to give people really the big picture. So we added up um, all of the property taxes that are collected, the state budget, federal, as well as the larger authorities. And when you add it all up, uh, essentially we, have the, we are investing $117 billion every year wow. um, in supporting our public services. Mm -hmm. 
So um, what we thought would be constructive would be, since we are really looking for new investment capacity, that instead of only looking you know, at revenue raisers, to think about could we perform work more effectively and create, you know, m make money available to then uh, do the same work but cheaper and have money to then invest in other things. And so we looked at first uh, busing in the schools and then secondly, most recently, streets and roads. Okay, so let's say, what are the top three factors that influence and could jeopardize the quality of life in New Jersey? Because I feel like there's a lot of things we can talk yes. about. We're a donor state, you know, one of the biggest donor states. We have health care and pensions. So um, from your perspective, what are the top three that are the biggest challenge to New Jersey? Well, without a doubt, number one is the tax burden. Um, and that's really, that's not a partisan issue. It's just factual in that no matter what list you look at, the uh, cost of doing business, cost of living, property tax levels, we are always in the bottom decile or the top decile depending upon the list. And so from a competitive perspective, you know, our society is much more mobile mm -hmm. and people have choices and businesses have choices about where they grow jobs. So without a doubt, the, the tax burden is, uh, is primarily, I think, the number one issue. Um, underneath that is then the choices we're making on investments and I think infrastructure, um, that's why we did the roads and streets. Mm -hmm. You know how we spend that money in order to fuel the economy is much. You know I think the primary criteria, rather than you know distributing money evenly among all counties or making different choices, it ought to be how do we grow the economy um, with infrastructure investments. And then um, you know I'd say that uh, lastly, from an education perspective. We have a terrific, you know, education system. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, that's the largest component of property taxes, which I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. But I think in particular, we can look at, um, you know, we rank one or two with Massachusetts in terms of quality of education, but we spend 15% more. Wow. And what that translates when you're spending $26 billion on K through 12 education, that's $4 billion of investment capacity. That's significant. You know, right. Yeah. Right. That we're spending that Massachusetts isn't and getting virtually the same outcome. So I think we can look at specifically, you know, areas to find investment capacity. So let's talk about that. What are they doing better or different? Like, I mean, are they sharing resources? I know we have 600 school districts. 650. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. It's grown. <laughs> so, yes. yeah. So can you talk about that? With well, certainly okay. it's the number of districts. Okay. Um, look at Manhattan, you know, they have a dozen mm -hmm. districts, right? And the same number of students. We have 1.2 million students in our K through 12 mm -hmm. and they have 12 districts. Um, now it's ge geographically, you know, different, of course, and transportation different. But um, without a doubt, um, you know, we need to think about how we can more effectively continue to provide the great education. But I think from the oversight perspective, we can consolidate. Um, and I know that that's a uncomfortable word, you know, for a lot of individuals. But you can retain if you really understand what distinguishes the school's ability to deliver education and what is really something that can be done at a higher level. I think it will make people more more comfortable with that idea. You know, I find it it's tough because when you talk about consolidation of school districts, everybody loves their school. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves their superintendent. And so I think it takes a lot of political will and a whole mind shift to be able to switch people into the idea that we would combine. So there's discussion of combining school districts into county mm -hmm. school districts. But how do we get there because I feel like a lot of people don't want to give that up. Part of their quality education is that they can walk to their school or, you right. know, that it's small. Well, that's why, honestly, we looked at a function rather than going directly at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we did is school busing. And if you really dealt with school busing the way Maryland does or the state of Washington does, that, you know, we could actually just pull that function out, which really doesn't uniquely contribute to your school experience, right? What you care about is that your child is safe, gets to school on time, and doesn't spend more than X minutes on the bus. And if you get those things, then uh, you, know, you can do it more effectively. You can get uh, costs down and start to save the money that I think we can um, at, the, at each district level, but you're doing it at a higher level. And I don't know if it's county or state or right. region. I'm not you know, advocating for one or the other. But I know that if we can pull out some functions that don't really grow value you know, for the school experience, I think we'll be better off. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think that people are willing to pay higher property taxes if their education is good, but there is an out-migration problem in New Jersey. And so if there's a conflict in terms of if you have 
older people staying and they're not using it, that's a good thing. They're not using our schools, that's a good thing. They're not putting a strain on it. But when they retire, they're leaving. And so you have an in, an in migration of young people. But then you also hear there's an out migration of millennials. So I'm not quite sure which it is, but they, the United Van Line says sure, that sure. Re retirement people are leaving for retirement. So can you just shed some light? Like, are people coming in? Are they leaving? Is it the millennials are staying? Are they really leaving? I feel like there's such conflicting information on that. And I don't, you know, I don't yeah. know. I'll, I'll give you a comment yeah. on that, but I don't know that it matters, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the way we're trying to approach it is, you have to look at how other people are your competitors, right? We're in a dogfight. I mean, to your, this point, right? right? We're in a dogfight for both jobs and residents. And we're in dogfight with the other states. And so what you have to look at is your competitors, mm -hmm. right? What are they doing? And are they doing anything better than me? I better, you know, get smart quick. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we look at, like, how does Maryland do busing? Or, you know, how does Pennsylvania do bridge, rapid bridge uh, repairs and renovations to the, the, for the cost of the roads and streets? And so if you can make yourself more competitive, because at the end, um, you know, what's going to matter is the cost of living, right? Whether it's driven by the schools or the roads or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's the overall cost of living. And so, uh, to your point now about the out-migration, yep. um, you know, there's indisputable IRS data that shows that on a net income basis, we are losing ground. Um, you, know, you can argue about all the reasons why, but the fact is, on a net basis, income is leaving New Jersey. And that means wealth is leaving New Jersey, and that's just a bad thing. And that, you know, if you'll permit me to talk about, you know, and what's happening is a result is our economy is suffering compared to other states. So the most recent GDP growth numbers came out and New Jersey ranked dead last in terms of growth of our economy. We tied with Maryland for mainland U.S. And what you look at is a, you know, national average of 3.1% and we were at 1.8. Hmm. New York was at 3.8, right? More than twice the growth rate of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania was 2.9. So that's a, you know, an end result that I know none of us, we, we're uncomfortable with it, but that's the result of having an unattractive environment for both jobs and residences. Mm -hmm. And so we need to address the, you know, the core problems and, uh, as you say, except we have to change. Well, I love that you said that because I feel like as I was talking about in, in migration and out migration, people do get caught up in the weeds and they forget it is about competitiveness. And so um, kind of going back out to transportation, mm. um, let's talk a little bit about that because my husband goes into the city every day. Last night he's trying to come home and all the trains canceled, 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 yeah, delayed. I saw that. Yeah. And so you've done a lot of research about um, uh, reducing the spend per mile, etc. Right. So I feel like this is one of the biggest issues that New Jersey faces. If we don't fix transportation, people will leave because if they can't get to work, why live here? Right, right. right. And why have jobs here, even for people to get from you know other places? Right. So um, you know, we actually I agree that we need to invest more, and you know, I think Gateway is a no-brainer, and we need to invest you know in transit. And so we looked at is could we free up money to be able to do that? So we actually looked at the other side, which are roads, streets, and bridges, and how do other states really manage that? And um, more, most recently, actually, the Reasons Report came out, and it showed an astronomical cost per mile for New Jersey, and the New Jersey was most expensive. And um, there's a lot of issues I have, which I won't go into, mm -hmm. but when we did it, we did it independent against seven other states. And the fact is, you know, we came up with a much lower number, which was about 240,000 per mile, but we were still the highest in the region when we did it on a like-for-like -like basis, accounting for geography and density. So we are spending more than the seven peer states. And, you know, when we look at other states, things like, I mentioned Pennsylvania, right? They have a public-private partnership to do restoration on 500 bridges. Mm. And, you know, what they said, what they did it that way is because they can do it 10 years faster than the DOT said they could do those 500 bridges, and the ongoing maintenance will be 40% less. You know, we should look at that. Right. We have a lot of bridges, but we all know that, uh, to restore. What's the challenge? Why, wh why don't we do that in New Jersey from your perspective? Well, I think it's part of that we're so fractured, right? We have not only, right, 650 uh, schools, but 560 municipalities mm -hmm. and 21 counties and a DOT. And the idea that, you know, um, that we aren't one team, I think, is underneath, um, you know, why we handle things at a micro level. And when you do things at small levels, you just never get economies. And I think we have to find places where we can find better economies in how we conduct work. 
like back to the roads, right? How you, you know, we've all had the experience, right, of we pass both a municipal truck uh, during a snowstorm or after a snowstorm, <laughs> municipal truck, a county truck, and a state truck within about two miles of one another. Right. We probably could do that smarter. Those are just, you know, small examples of, you know, we have to let go. Some municipality work needs to get done other ways, mm -hmm. and municipalities are probably going to pick up some work that they weren't doing before, mm -hmm. and vice versa at the state level. But I think if we can get on one team, we could find those opportunities. Well, even locally with our Morris Bridge, the mm -hmm. Morris Avenue Bridge, it was state, county, yep. muni. Um, but I always come back to the question, I find it is a challenge because the political will, because I've had a lot of guests come on and they're like, we know what we have to do, but it's very difficult to get people around the table and other states have made it work. Is there a magic bullet that you could point to and say, Massachusetts is doing X and this is exactly what we should adopt? Or is it not that easy? Of course, it's not yeah, that easy, yeah, right? There's yeah. no silver bullet, but to your direct question, it means it's not just up to political people, it's up to all of us, mm. right? We all need to, you know, really press those individuals who are in those positions as to how we're going to uh, work on this and get involved, form, you know, citizen committees, mm -hmm. right, that actually participate in the decision making about how different legislation and regulation gets put in place. I think the more active the citizenry we have, the more accountable then the elected officials become. Right. Well, and I love that idea that ha having third party um, committees look at mm -hmm. what's happening. So, for example, we were talking earlier off camera about different programs sunsetting. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a budget, a lot of the time programs will just continue to roll over and they're not being evaluated. So um, the New York Times reported just recently that um, there allegedly there were some businesses that said they were going to leave New Jersey. There was 12 companies that they were going to go to New York. They didn't end up going, but they still got business incentives. Mm -hmm. And so these business incentive, incentives left the taxpayers on the hook because the companies never left, but they didn't really change their business practice. And I think that's a criticism that is legitimate in some aspect, but at the same time, we still need business incentives because we want businesses to come and stay. So is there a balance between all of that? And you can talk about even the independent committees sure. that can can sure. help with that. Yes, yeah, so let's separate the two things. One is the policy, the economic policy, and the other is the administration of the uh, programs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the easier one, uh, the more direct one I'll, I'll address is the administration because, I mean, what best practices are for, um, you know, other states according to Pew Research who looked at all the economic incentive programs around the country is that these programs should be reviewed, you know, every at least two years, preferably one year and I'll come back to the who should review it. But so frequency and administration, I mean, that's just good business practice. And if there was mishandling or you know, misrepresentation, that should be addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them were reviewed and approved, so as you say, it's an article and a paper, and I'm sure that that's all gonna be you know, reviewed on the administrative side. Um, I think people were working in the best interest of the state uh, at the EDA, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure that they'll be you know, you know, found out to perform the job appropriately. Um, but on the other side, so on the policy side, so economic incentives are really, as I referenced before, right, when you're in a dog fight, you have to have tools that help you win that fight. Mm -hmm. Economic incentives are one of those tools that level the playing field if we're going to continue to have a high tax rate. So other states have lowered their tax rates. New York's corporate rate is 6%, right? Ours is 11 and a half. Wow. So when you're competing with another state, you have to have a tool. Now, I think it'd be smarter to lower the 11 and a half and figure out how to attract jobs at a more fundamental level. But we're gonna need incentives. They're in every state. The level is a function of how uncompetitive you are. And that's really what's driving the amount. So, I mean, I, I, I'm indifferent on them, um, but I mean, I, I think the reality is you're gonna have to have some of them at all times. And the sooner we renew the program, the better. You know, we're sitting now, as we sit here today in September of 2019, with no tools in the hands of the people who are trying to convince businesses to bring jobs here. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to get on with it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think too, I read an article, it's a statistic that 5,800, and don't fully quote me, but 5,800 wealthy citizens left New Jersey. And so to your point, if you constantly have your wealth leaving the state, you are taking money away that supports the programs for the people who need it right? Education, hospitals, et cetera. So um, I, you know, I feel like you can't totally get rid of business incentives, but we have to find a, a nice 
Well, level. what you're speaking to is, is uh, a point that's been made recently, so, and that studies from Wealth X, um, okay. who, uh, and you had the right number. Okay. So, um, what is really interesting about this whole idea of, um, you know, tax levels and what it drives in behavior is that uh, Pew actually just did another study, and they looked at how states have recovered since the 08 recession in terms of state revenue generation. Mm -hmm. So how have we come back to being above or below what the state was generating in 08? And what's really interesting is you see New York has escalated faster than anyone in the region, and they're well above their 08 levels. Mm -hmm. And they've also have a lower tax rate, both at the corporate level and interestingly enough, lower personal income tax rate as well. Mm -hmm. So it's proving this point of you don't have to continually you know, raise taxes to raise money. It's more attractive and healthier long term to organically build the economy and be attractive to bring jobs and bring people and that actually grows the state revenue as a result. We by the way lagged terribly. Uh, we still haven't come back when you, on a um, you know index basis. Mm -hmm. We're still not back to the 08 level in New Jersey. Wow. Yeah. So as we're winding down our 30 minutes already, <laughs> I want to just recap. So the quality of life factors that we talked about taxes, um, transportation, um, uh, re GDP, revenue, these are some of the most critical issues that New Jersey is facing today. And so if anyone is out there, they should be talking to their legislators who, if they're interested in their quality of life and how to keep you know, their community strong, these are big issues that they should be focused on. Is that right? Absolutely. At, at every level, right? Council, Board of Ed, Mm -hmm. as well as the state legislators. I mean, mm -hmm. they're all, we're all part of the, the solution and uh, the opportunity. Yeah, I feel like people t tend to feel helpless, but they're not. Not at all. There's a lot they can do. So before we run, because you have um, really a highly visible think tank, and this summer I did a whole series on women leaders in politics and policy. So I hope you don't mind if I just segue for just a few minutes sure. um, on your leadership style, because I feel like you're really out there trying to um, put New Jersey on a new course that is fiscally sound. What kind of leadership do you feel is needed across the state um, that would help us maintain our health, you know, yeah. and be competitive? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's a little too trite to say, you know, it's got to be nonpartisan because these are not ideological points. So I think, you know, putting all of our badges down and, um, you know, really thinking about being on Team New Jersey. And number two, um, what we talked about a lot today, you know, there's going to be a lot of change, and that's really hard. Uh, we learn this in business. We, we can see it in public life as well. Change is difficult for people if they've been doing something the same way. If they can't see the picture of what you're going to, they can't let go of what they've got. So I think, you know, the leadership we need in New Jersey is who can create that picture of how this really has to change in order for us to prosper as a whole state. And then people are willing to listen. And I think that's really how you can open up uh, open the years. So being creative, but also articulate about how we have to change, I think will motivate people to understand that um, it's not going to be a bad thing. In fact, we end up better on the other end. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you to Regina, my, Thanks, my guest. Um, for your keen insight. I appreciate um, all your expertise on the fiscal matters today. And I'm Lisa Allen, and this is As a Matter of Fact. We're coming to you from HTTV Studios in Summit, New Jersey. For more information and programming like this, please check out our website, our Facebook page, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Have a great day.